So we're nearing the end of World War II. Uh, Germany has already surrendered. Hitler and Mussolini are both dead. And Japan is in trouble. The island hopping strategy by the United States had become effective. They had taken the islands of Okinawa and Iwo Jima, uh, much to uh, the chagrin of the United States. It came at a very high cost in terms of the life, lives of Japanese and their own men. Uh, Tokyo had been firebombed to the point where the city was uh, left a shell of its former self, and the worst was yet to come. Uh, the United States had been working on the Manhattan Project, and they had perfected the atomic bomb. Uh, what you see here is the Trinity test in New Mexico, where the United States scientists put together the final pieces of the atomic weapon of releasing the energy in atoms of uh, uranium and plutonium, and the test went off as a success, and the United States knew that they had a weapon that could greatly uh, greatly bring about the end of the war at a faster pace, and at the same time save American lives. Uh, what you see right here is how the, the bomb effectively works. Uh, plutonium and uranium are radioactive substances, and the radioactivity and the these elements themselves, uh, the atoms in them, are a little bit more unstable than a lot of other naturally occurring elements. And the idea was to create explosion which would release uh, the the particles from those uh, those atoms and cause a chain reaction uh, which would release the energy from other atoms, creating a massive explosion in just a fraction of a second. And so the United States had been working on this. And this shows you the explosion, uh, the Trinity test, at 1 one fortieth, uh, or excuse me, one fortieth of one second after the explosion. You see this massive, uh, basically uh, looks like a giant bubble, and you see the smoke billowing out from the bottom. And this is like immediately after the the detonation occurs, and it gets worse. You see right here, this is at 10 seconds, the massive mushroom cloud. Uh, that has become synonymous with the atomic bombs that were going to be used on Japan. Uh, the explosion, you can tell just from the, the perspective on this, uh, encompasses a very large portion of land. All right, so these atomic bombs are going to be utilized, and the first one is dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Uh, the devastation from these bombs cannot really be overstated. Uh, when the detonation occurs, they believe that uh, at the hypocenter of the blast, within about uh, one square mile of the blast, you would have temperatures closing in on 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's surface of the sun level hot. So anything near there would have been vaporized immediately. Uh, the fallout is pretty dreadful when you look at it. Um, there are a number of people, according to this little infographic, the population, 70,000 people, were killed by the blast itself or in the, the next hour or so. Uh, by the end of the year, you had an additional 140,000 people who were dead by the year's end from radiation sickness or the wounds that they received as a result. Um, people didn't think anything of it when they saw the American plane flying overhead because it was just uh, one plane as a bomber and one as an observational plane, and so they, they didn't think anything of it. Uh, and unfortunately for them, they, uh, they had no idea of what was coming. Uh, you also see the explosion here at a distance uh, from Nagasaki three days later. After the first atomic bomb was dropped, uh, Japan did not surrender. And three days later, the United States picked another target. And uh, you see the devastation from that, too. The perspective is a little bit better because you can see things like an automobile, it uh, looks like a little warehouse and a little overpass or bridge. Uh, you see what appears to be uh, electrical or telephone wires. And so you can see the enormity of the explosion. Uh, here, the the casualties aren't as high, but only because the bomb uh, in Hiroshima uh, was dropped right at the center of the city. Whereas this one, they were off a little bit and it hit towards the periphery of Nagasaki. But the number of people killed, uh, absolutely devastating. Uh, the two atomic bombs are dropped, and of course a large number of people die in those three days, but the devastation afterwards, here you look and you see an American observer who has come to see uh, what happened as a result of that, and the buildings are just obliterated. Uh, the intensity of the heat blast melts even the hottest steel, or the hardest steel, and you see right here uh, what looks to you be like old, an old city grid. Many of the buildings are just wiped out entirely.
uh, this looks like a legitimate war zone where people had been living or had not been living uh, for some time, but it was really wiped out in pretty much an instant. You also see right here uh, a lot of the rubble left behind, and uh, you see one statue, uh, but you're also going to see, if you look carefully, uh, some people who did not quite make it. Some people survived the atomic bomb blast, though, uh, just by sheer luck. Uh, you see right here the person on the left has a strange pattern on her skin. Uh, it's because her clothes, uh, the pattern on her clothing was seared into her skin. On the right, you see a small child. Hair loss was a common uh, problem uh, that came about when uh, people survived the blast. The radiation does something that caused a lot of people to lose their hair in their entirety or just in strange patches. Uh, people experienced a number of other problems, burns, uh, third-degree burns on their skin. And uh, you see on the right, uh, that poor girl's got a bandaged face and an arm. Uh, it's not something that people... Uh, <laughs> know how to deal with at the time either. The doctors were a little bit uh, puzzled by what was going on. You see right here, this man has had some time to heal, but the heat has basically uh, melted or seared his skin in a way that has left permanent scars, which was another common thing for the people who were uh, able to survive the atomic bomb blasts. Finally, uh, five days after that second atomic bomb, the, uh, the Japanese government decides that they need to surrender. Uh, there were a lot of reasons. Of course, the atomic bombs produced so much devastation that uh, they didn't really have any choice. But at the same time, they were also concerned that the Soviet Union was going to, to help the United States invade the island if, uh, if it came to that. And they did not want to have to surrender to the Soviet Union. Uh, August 14th, they refer to that as VJ Day, Victory in Japan Day. And that is the day right here you see the United States uh, and the naval officers aboard the USS Missouri getting ready to accept the Japanese surrender. Uh, here are Japanese officials coming to officially sign the documentation uh, surrendering Japan to the United States. And this marks the official end of World War II. Uh, you see right here people back home celebrating in Times Square in New York City. A uh, man waving the American flag. Somebody's got newspaper headlines. People are cheering. Uh, this is a reason to celebrate. There's a lot that's been lost in terms of human life during World War II, and so Americans are ecstatic. Uh, it also produced this iconic picture where a sailor grabs a random nurse on the street and kisses her, doesn't even know her at all, but uh, there's a lot of people looking around, and they seem to think it's interesting, uh, but the woman was not overly thrilled about that. Uh, nevertheless, that's a, a picture that still remains a, a part of an important legacy in World War II. Now, right before the war had ended, um, there was another big meeting between the big three nations, between Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union, uh, this time at Potsdam in, uh, in Eastern Europe. And at Potsdam, uh, the big three has changed a little bit. Franklin Roosevelt had died at this point. He had a cerebral hemorrhage in April. Uh, and Winston Churchill's party got voted out of office. And so what you see now is a new big three. Stalin is still there, uh, Harry Truman, the new president of the United States, and Clement Attlee from Great Britain. And the Potsdam Conference, they, uh, they accomplished a couple things. They finalized the zones for uh, the occupation of Germany and Eastern Europe. And the Soviet Union felt pretty good about where they were. The Red Army had pushed all the way into uh, central Germany, and they had a good portion of central Europe and eastern Europe under their control, and they wanted those countries to be in their sphere of influence. Uh, they claimed they weren't going to outright dominate those countries or try to absorb them into the Soviet Union, but they definitely wanted to influence them, and Stalin feels like he's in a good position. Not only that, but uh, Stalin uh, is uh, maybe misperceived a little bit. Even though people understood he's not exactly a nice guy, uh, they thought they were dealing with an ally in the war, but uh, these three countries you're going to see quickly turn from friends to not exactly friends. Uh, Truman and uh, Clement Attlee, though, are able to wrestle some, uh, some things from Stalin as well. Uh, they finalize deals about war reparations, about how to repatriate or meaning... Uh, take all the displaced people from the war and get them back home to where they belong uh, if they wanted to go home. So, you know, they're trying to set up rules and regulations about how to govern Germany in their zones and what they would do in terms of how to operate it. 
Uh, the Soviet Union, by the way, they were going to completely loot uh, their portion of the German zone. Uh, they wanted to punish their section of Germany, their zone of Germany they had. Uh, whereas Clement Attlee and Truman and the French, too, uh, they wanted to rebuild uh, Germany to make it a democracy, to make it an important part of Europe. Uh, they didn't want uh, a permanently weakened Germany forever. Uh, so that's the situation that you see there at the end of the war. And there's a lot of other things that are to be dealt with, one of which is uh, we find out the extent of what was going on with the Holocaust.